Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back. Welcome in and welcome back to another exciting episode of the Elvis Workshop. You might notice a little bit of a change here. There's a different angle coming in and there's this obnoxious thing in front of me. Um, so I did a little bit of an upgrade here. I've had some people tell me that there have been some issues with um, audio, which I agree. Uh, camera was too far away. It was over there on the, uh, the new record player that I have while well, the cabinet. I'll show you in a minute and um, that they were having a little bit of a problem hearing me clearly. So um, I've got an event coming up here at the house and I kind of needed a PA for it really badly. So I went and sprang for one for the party and I figured that I could also utilize it in the Elvis workshop videos. So hopefully this will help you hear me a lot better. So let me give you a quick look at the new updated redesigned Elvis workshop here and uh, take a look at this and then I'll be right back. All right, so I've done a nice professional upgrade to the Elvis workshop. So here we have one of the very well-known 50s, I think they call it a ribbon mic, set up with then a standard, more modernized microphone. Got a small PA down here. And on this side, where we film from, I've got a ring set up with the uh, little pinch thing in the middle for the... Uh, for the phone slash camera and uh oh here's a new addition to the elvis workshop that's an old um rca nipper dog record player the record player is missing that you can see a split in the middle there where the record player is sitting on top you can see that split in the wood this left side lifts up and there's a picture of the nipper dog in there the cabinet on the right on the top opens up and the radio dials were in there and the cabinet on the left, lower left, opened up and you could store records in there. So it's a vintage cabinet record player, uh, which is just a cabinet now. But I have the record player sitting on top of it. So this is how the Elvis Workshop looks behind the scenes. There we go. And that's what it looks like. There's your behind the scenes look at the updated Elvis Workshop. All right, so that's pretty cool, right? So... Got some new stuff in here. Got an extra uh, 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 second mic for uh, my friends when they're doing guest appearances here. Got the new thing that you just looked at with the light there. Um, I don't know that it'll make me look any better, but anyway. <laughs> anyway, so I like this new setup. I can actually hear myself a lot better in here, so I'm no, I know it's gonna help you look, uh, hear me a lot better, and you'll look better too, right? So this mic is awesome. I've always loved the, I guess it's the ribbon mic. What is this thing called? But I have a, I have a fake one here that I bought just for display years ago, just because I love this, uh, this design of this microphone. And of course Elvis used it in the fifties. A lot of artists use it in the fifties. So anyway, let's get to today's video. And thanks again for tuning in. So I've got a bunch of stuff up here, but I really want to talk about what's hanging behind me. So um, let me get a couple of the other things out of the way first, and then we'll get to that story about this 78 right here because it's pretty interesting. Um, I don't want to reach all the way over there and kill myself, but that is the guitar that changed the world uh, by Scotty Moore. There was a, a recording session that I think it fell through is what happened. Um, and so Scotty used the time to record some songs. If you haven't heard of that or if you're not aware of it, Google the Guitar That Changed the World by Scotty Moore. It's instrumental only, but it's Scotty Moore playing all the, the well, not all of, because there were so many, but a, a lot of the hits that he had with Elvis. And uh, it's just him redoing the, the songs. It's a great album. It's very low key. A lot of people don't even know it's available. No, don't even know that it's out there, but it's really worth picking up. So go check it out. So um, you've heard of the Bear Family label. I'm sure if you're watching this and you've watched a bunch of my other videos, I'm sure you've heard of the Bear Family. Bear Family is a German, uh, a German family uh, that they put out um, very high quality 50s material. And uh, I ran across this Gene Vincent thing. We're going to get to the Elvis stuff here in a minute. Please don't bail on me. Just give me, a, give me some time. You'll love the story of that 78, this right here, hanging behind me. Just give me a couple minutes because I think some of this deserves some attention. So I saw this we'll sh We Sure Miss Eugene Vincent seven, um, 12, uh, 10 inch record uh, the other day. It was $39 and I almost passed on it, but I thought, mm, you know, I really don't have, I've got some Gene Vincent on CD, but I would really, really do well by having this 10 inch vinyl. So I bought it 
and then I was really, really pleasantly surprised. So the record is inside here. I don't want to pull it out because you're not going to see much there. But let me show you what else you get. So I slipped this thing open. I didn't expect any of this. First of all, there's a CD of the same songs that are on the record. Then there's a postcard with a headshot of Gene on it, which I thought was really cool. There's an advertisement for other 10 inch vinyl packages from the Bear family, but then there's this really, really nice booklet. And I'm not just gonna flip through it, but I'll just show it to you. This thing is awesome. Bear family does not cut corners ever. They always put out great material. And this thing is, um, <laughs> it lives up to their standards. So I listened to it, it's really good. So, you know, speaking of Gene Vincent, let me s s skip over here to Eddie real quick. So Eddie, Eddie Cochran. So I went to a record show um, in um, Anaheim over the weekend. And um, I, thought, I thought that I had remembered that Eddie Cochran was buried uh, in Anaheim. So I Googled it, and of course he was. And so we stopped at the cemetery on the way to the record store, or record, sh record show, and paid our respects uh, to Eddie Cochran. Forest Lawn Cemetery in Anaheim. Rock and roll pioneer, Eddie Cochran. Tragically killed at the age of 21. Then we went to the record show, and um, I actually made it a point to search out some Eddie Cochran. I really didn't find anything, to be honest with you. And about 15 minutes before we left, I found this as a two record set. You know, and Eddie was uh, just getting going when he was unfortunately killed. And on the back of this, it says, don't forget me, Eddie Cochran. It's a signed photo, beautiful photo of him. And it looks like in the recording studio. No, 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 it's not in the recording studio. I apologize. But it's a headshot, a, a, a promo photo of some sort. It looks like, and it says, don't forget about me, Eddie Cochran. But there's three songs on here. Obviously his big hit, Summertime Blues. Um, but then there's uh, Milk Cow Blues Boogie, which Elvis also did, which Eddie's version is absolutely great. It's really great. But probably my favorite, uh, my favorite song uh, by him is called Something Else. And man, if you haven't heard Eddie Cochran, Something Else, do yourself a favor. After you get done watching this video, go to YouTube again and type in Eddie Cochran and something else. That song is so good, it's scary. It's so good. And uh, I just, I, I picked up a few more records while I was there. This is Johnny Rivers' Golden Hits Live. It's just a, it's a um, compilation of live recordings that he did. The Glenn Campbell, Gentle on My Mind. I, ha I have this, but this was in better condition. Here's the man, Bobby Blue Bland. He's a part of the Sun story, a very small part, but he was there. He was the driver for B.B. Uh, King. Either B.B. didn't drive or didn't like to drive that much. And his chauffeur was Bobby Bland, Bobby Blue Bland. And he started getting his opportunity to sing too. And if you, if you listen to me on anything in this video, go pick up his California album by Bobby Blue Bland. You will not be disappointed. So that's a great one. Here's the man. This is a 1982 copy. It's on Electra Records, but it's a first edition 1982 copy of Motley Crue's debut album, Too Fast for Love. How cool is that? And I have this album three or four times, but not this one. And now I do. And then this is the last one up here, The Tubes. The thing that's funny about this, um, it's kind of a punk band. You probably, a lot of people don't know who they are, but it says, this is cool. This is an original hype sticker on it. It says, certain vulgarities are uttered on the track. What do you want from life? And between songs three and four. <laughs> hype sticker was warning you about the cursing. I bought this basically just for that hype sticker. I really do like the Tubes. They're a fun live band. They're still around. This is their first live album and it's from the mid seventies. But uh, I thought this was pretty cool. So I picked that up. So. We're almost there. Give me a minute. Don't bail on me. Um, Carl Perkins, whole lot of shaking. This is his his debut album, I believe, debut album on Capitol. And um, I picked this up too, The Sun Story, Volume 3. But uh, this was Carl switching from Sun over to Capitol and trying to cap capture that uh, Sun glory by doing a bunch of Sun covers. 
didn't really work out for him that well. And then this I picked up while I was there, the Pink Pedal Pushers, this is Carl Perkins' initial single when he got to Capitol Records. Um, his career just never ended up being the same as it was on the Sun label, but it's cool to follow the whole history of him in my opinion, he's worth it to me. Okay, last thing. Well, not last thing, but close to it. This is another thing I picked up from a friend of mine. It's a, ch a Japanese version of What I Say and uh, Viva Las Vegas on 45. And this is interesting that the sleeve doesn't fit. The record comes separately and it does have the Chinese uh, or Japanese writing on it. And it, excuse me, it comes, a little, it comes separate. It's Viva Las Vegas, What I Say. Sound on this is crystal clear. Really, really nice sound on that thing. And this really frustrated me. The last video that I just did, I talked about the Tickle Me soundtrack and some of the songs that were on a couple of the albums that I showcased for the um, the Lost album, FTD, that just came out. And I had this sitting five feet away and I forgot about it. This would have been nice to put in there. This is the Tickle Me 45. Would have been good to put in there. Okay, so let me get to this over here, and then I'm gonna get to my story about the 45. That's the main point of the whole video. So I picked up I picked up another version of Elvis's very first uh, album on RCA, Elvis Presley, and I wanted to show you something just in case you're not aware. Um, the, the the sleeves of the covers on these are almost always just thrashed, and the records are sometimes in pretty good condition. I'm not gonna pull this out because the cape, the sleeve is kind of beat up, but I'm gonna show you a still shot here. So the way that you can tell if it's the first pressing or a second or third or fourth or fifth pressing and so on and so forth, the very first one on the B side, just because uh, the songwriting credit just says PD and that's not initials for somebody, that means public domain. And there was a big outcry about songwriters because they said, hey, wait a minute, we should be getting credit for this and this is a hit album. So the next pressing of it, the name of the songwriter was on there, but the original pressing if you find a, a, the uh, that Elvis Presley album in a record store pull it out flip it over to side B look at just because and see if it looks like this right here so that's what it looks like if that's a first edition the PD that's your key pick that copy up I got this for six bucks and then I go to the record shops, record stores, and I see them for 60, 80, 150, 120. You go to the records, the right record store and you get them, get them pretty cheap. Okay, so I keep saying last thing. <laughs> it was a big record show. So I'm not gonna go through all these because I don't want to waste your time, but I did I just want to show you some of the things you can find out there. Sun in the wild. This is always fun. So I got uh, Little Queenie by Jerry Lee Lewis, Sun. And then uh, I've got Dixie Fried. I actually got this off of a website. Dixie Fried, Cry, 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 Johnny Cash. Very nice. I actually haven't played that one yet. And Cadillac Man. Uh, by the Jesters, which this is a precursor to the song um, uh, <laughs> My Babe. My Babe, which Elvis covered in 1969. And um, so it's cool to have the original song that inspired My Babe on Sun label, so that's cool. And this is something else, and then I'll get to the 78 story, I promise you. These are, the, if, you're, if you're interested in the early Elvis records, but you can't afford the Suns, like, like these over there, um, this one here, these, if you can't afford those, they're expensive, they really are. And I can't even afford them either. It's taken years and years to get even the few that I have. So when Elvis was on Sun Records and he got bought by RCA, his contract got bought by RCA, one of the parts of the agreement was that all of his previous Sun material now owned, was owned by RCA. So they re-released it. I didn't know this for years. I thought that these were 1970s replicas of reproductions and all that. And I, I just thought they were just cheap copies. But I found out later, you know, you can always learn something new, right? That when Elvis came over to the RCA label, they reissued his five Sun singles. So I've been picking these up. So this is a whole stack of them. And uh, this is all five of his Sun singles uh, re-released, re, re re-re-re-re-released -re -re on the RCA label. And they did get reproduced later in the 70s. Um, and then years later, of course, now they reproduce them. But 
these are originals <clears throat> from when he first popped onto the RCA label. So they're almost almost as old as the Sun singles and uh, not nearly as expensive. You can find those on eBay for pretty cheap. So just something to look at. Um, the master tapes were sent to RCA and they kind of tinkered with them a little bit and then re-released them. And some of them actually sound better than the original Suns. I hate to say that because I'm a Sun purist and I love the Sun label and I love the Sun sound. But some of these RCA re-releases of the original material actually sound better. So if you're looking for some early Elvis, go pick up those RCA uh, re-releases of the original Sun releases on 45. Okay, so let's get to this over here. So for any of you that have watched my older videos, you will have seen this 78 hanging right here. The reason that it's hanging there, there's actually a few reasons. One is it's a cool re retro looking design. It's um, uh, obviously a copy of uh, My Happiness and that's when your heartache begins. And um, they play nice, but I didn't, I didn't have a record player that played 78s. So I couldn't even play this thing. I bought it, I, I love it, but I couldn't even play it. So I thought it'd be nice for a wall hanger. Well, now I have a player that can play 78s, and I kind of, kind of wanted to play this, So, but I still left it on the wall. So if you watched my second to last video before this one, you will have seen me and Warren talking about uh, my 78 copy of That's All Right, which it looks like that one hanging on the wall, but it's actually not. It's, it's this one right here. So this is my copy of Sun 209 on 78, plays perfectly. It does have a crack on it, but it doesn't skip, doesn't pop, nothing. It plays great, and um, it's that's the one that I had. I've never in my life had a Sun 78. They're too rare, they're too expensive, you just don't run across them. Now, now you're thinking, well, now it looks like you have two. Well, I do have two, <laughs> but how I came about it. So um, a friend of mine, <laughs> was acquiring a collection from a uh, an estate sale and there were a bunch of trinkets like teddy bears and you know the valentine's tins from um walgreens that have elvis in the army with a heart around it and all that kind of cheap crap and in the collection was a bunch of records well in that record collection was that 78 of that's all right. It's it's Sun 209. It's Elvis's very first record again. So now I have two of them. Um, and to give you a little backstory on this, what's very interesting is that when when this record was originally released, um, Elvis actually went and visited um, was it Plastic Products, the name of the place. Anyway, I, I'm going to show you what it looks like right here. In Memphis, Tennessee, and uh, Plastic Products, yeah, and he went and actually watched the pressing of his first record and obtained a 78 of it while he was there and gave it to a friend of his. So I don't know if they were pressing 45s at the same time, but they were definitely pressing 78s because he took one home with him, at least one. He may have taken more than one, but he took at least one because he signed it and gave it to a friend of his. So anyway, my, my buddy was uh, <laughs> picking up this collection from these people this record was pressed in 1954. It's lasted all these years. And uh, during the transfer of the product from one person to the next, um, the record was dropped. So let me show you how it looked when I picked it up. That's terrible, isn't it? It makes you sick, doesn't it? <laughs> so that record's actually very valuable. Very, very valuable. It's Elvis's very first record. It's a 78, which is more rare than a 45. It was in pristine condition, excellent condition. And you saw how I got it, right? Take another look. So that's how I got it. So the value of it <laughs> plummeted <laughs> quickly. 
And uh, my friend told me about it and I said, listen, it's gotta come to the Elvis workshop. I need that to be on my wall as a wall hanger for when I do my um, vlogs, whatever you call these things, my videos. And um, he agreed, so I picked it up from him and I very gently put it back together and pressed it against the glass and in between the cardboard behind it and all that. And so now on the wall, it looks like a perfect record. Perfect, but, but behind the scenes, it looks like this. And that's not good, but Anyway, it's a beautiful wall hanger now, and, and that's what it's going to do. So this one over here plays perfectly, and I'll play it every once in a while, just every once in, in a blue moon, no pun intended. And this one will be a nice wall hanger for people to check out when they come into the Elvis workshop. So anyway, so I want to talk to you about a couple of these records. I want to show you the, the, the way you can tell if you have a first pressing of the Elvis Presley album and talk to you about my new 78 wall hanger back there and also show you the updates to the Elvis workshop. So... Thank you for tuning in. Oh, I did it again. You know, I pre-planned so much and, and I've got so much going on and I've got so much in my head. So many things that I, plastic products, I've got, I don't want to forget anything. And then I always forget my stupid prop. And listen, some people think that the hound dog is cheesy and corny, but you know what? When I don't do it, you have no idea, people. You have no idea the complaints that I get. People say, why didn't you do the hound dog? Why didn't you, they love the stupid hound dog. I kind of do too. It's cheesy and stupid, but I guess it's my thing. So, and but I always forget. So, hang on a second. Damn it. I hope you like this video, but if you don't, it's because you ain't nothing but a hound dog. See you later.